Go get us a hitch. It would illustrate his point with a twinge in her gut, a precursor to the pain that would follow should she be too slow to jump. That her habit seemed to talk to her made sense. After all, the voice was, excuse me, was with her all the time now, cajoling, convincing, and threatening. Whenever she began to think her way out of this hole, there the voice would be all reasonable, all menace. She wouldn't have demanded it for herself. It was poison. The stuff had killed or made it known two or three gener two or three generations of her people. She hadn't asked for it, but she did have to have it. She sat for half an hour staring at the pill, the last of three she got from Julius. It was time to do a shot, no doubt about it. But she was still thinking. How is it that this capsule of white powder fucking like brown could command herself? What made her think about it more and more to the exclusion of all else? Yearned for it even when she already had a shot. She thought about what Maggie had said, a herd of ads. She wondered when she'd become part of the herd. She wondered where this would all end. She had to get ready for work. Where one pill used to get her toasty now it would just make her able to function. Just. As she began preparing the shot, measuring the water, peeling the bottle cap, she began to realize, to admit the truth, she had a problem. Her whole life was now controlled by this pill, by Julius. She ran an endless circuit between her home, her job, and the corner. She never went to movies, never had dinner with her friends. What friends? Her partner was sniffing something about her, though she tried to, to act normal. Everything she did nowadays led right to this tiny gel cap with her medicine in it. She was chained to it. Even as she thought that she needed help, she rejected it. No one could help her. She had to do this herself. And then the tears came. Hot and scalding, they burned the trail down her face, blurred her vision and spoiled her aim, where she had a needle poised to enter her vein. Her chest hitched, and she sobbed, a huge racking sob that stopped her operation. Damn! She couldn't see, and she needed her shot. She was unaware of her own desperate high-pitched whining. She stopped long enough to look at it again, placed the needle again and pushed the plunger. Soon she was awash in warmth and all those worries, those fears just went away. Washed away down the drain, no more pain. Am I insane? So what if I am? I feel better. She was cloaked in a blanket of indifference and nothing, nothing could take that away. It was all she needed. She put everything away, grabbed her jacket and left. She ran into Al, coming up the steps. Al had wanted to talk to Brenda quite some time about her problem, about himself, about the direction their careers were taking. Ever since he'd broken his leg, he and Brenda, through some string pulling, he suspected that she had engineered, had been homicide cops. That suited him. His leg couldn't stand the stresses put on it by the ripping and running of narcotics but he thought he knew why the change was Brenda. He did not for one minute believe that his girl could not snap out of her down the slide. She was tougher than that. She was like a brick wall with all its hardness and impenetrability. Brenda was made for the work of being a cop like he could never hope to be. But what made her so good at it? Made her dangerous, made it dangerous to her. He had decided he was gonna tell her what was up. No sugar coating, no frills, no lace. He would make it clear as crystal, and if it hurt her, she'd survive. Whatever was driving her to the dope and away from herself, away from him, he would stop. He had to. He was in love with her. He sat in his crappy sky blue Mustang, not one of these new jobs, but one of those Mustang twos they rolled out and placed on the public around 80 or 81. Terrible. He was slumped down and watching the street wake up. This part of Park Avenue was in the of Colonial Williamsburg. Many of the row houses looked like they did from that time and were still viable, though a lot of the owners had had them cut into apartments. Very few of these were still single family homes. Hell, there were many parts of Baltimore where entire blocks had absentee landlords or just plain abandoned. He supposed he understood the financial reasons for that, but with all the homeless walking the streets and breaking into abandoned buildings for shelter, why didn't the city just give them away? I was simple like that. Someone had to be. It wasn't that way in Bolton Hill. He supposed Brenda owed her fancy digs to the fact that she had no kids, 
Neither did he, but he didn't want to, wait, want to spend a fortune on rent. He watched his college kids with stipends from mom and dad and exited their lovely homes and apartments carrying Italian-made bicycles while the older inhabitants of the neighborhood started up their beamers and drove off. Morning, Ralph. Morning, Sam. He often referenced cartoons in his mind that way. Cartoons were simple. Coyote chases sheep, dog messes coyote. In his mind, he was about to start on the health care system, but he heard the door of Brenda's building ring. He was out of the car and halfway up the stairs before he could think of what to say. She started backwards as he ran up on him, then realizing it was him, she just stood there. Her pupils were tiny, making her irises look solid, look like solid black discs. She looked like she would sway and fall, but didn't. She looked awful. What's up, Al, my pal? Come and see your favorite gal? She giggled. Brenda never giggled. Her clothes were rumpled. She smelled like old sweat. Not just finished running ball sweat, slept in sweat. And there was an odor seeping from her pores, making a pharmacy cloud around her. What a picture. Tree line, park like Park Avenue, with its federal splendor and little boot scrapers at the feet of marble stairs, leading to ornate double doors on either side of the street. And Brenda, swaying at the top of her stairs, stinking and wasted out of her mind and on the way to work. This was going to take more time than he originally planned. <clears throat> you want to explain to these children, these grown-ups, that well, you should do the right thing. You should always do the right thing. It's a clear-cut thing. And I thought about it, and I was incredibly wrong. Um, I worked at the beginning of my addiction selling light bulbs. That was uh, 30 years ago. I'm calling people up and I'm talking to the maintenance man, the plant director, uh, or whoever's in charge. Who's the whoever's in charge of this building? I'm calling this guy up because I have a talent for convincing people to do what I want them to do, or to do what I find necessary for them to do. And then next week when I call this place, he's lost his job because he spent money on light bulbs that you can buy for, for 40 cents, $400 a shot. And when I realized that I was messing with people's lives with it, I thought at the time the right thing to do was to stop doing that kind of work. It wasn't honorable. Certainly wasn't a huge monetary gain for me. It was just wrong. Okay, so I flash forward a couple of years and now I work on the block. If you don't know what that is, ask your parents. <laughs> I'm on the door, and again, I'm this smooth, convincing guy. I didn't really care much about the guys who came down because they decided they wanted to be there. They got fleeced. If our hands got deep in their pockets, so what? What got me was the young ladies. Let's say, let's say 18, but sometimes we were younger. Beautiful girls who never should have came down. Never should have came down. And at the beginning of my addiction, I was, I was nice about it. I would say, you don't want to work here. You, you don't want to work here. I mean, this place will chew you up and spit you out. You don't, you know, you don't want to And towards the end of my addiction, I would say, yeah, I want it. Because the right thing for me to do at that point was get as much money as I could to support my dope habit. So here I stand, three years after getting clean, and I've accomplished quite a bit. Nothing for anybody to look at. I'm not driving a fancy car, I don't have a really great house or anything like that, but I have peace of mind. Hallelujah. <laughs> Until I 
found out that I need to get a job real fast. <laughs> and I find myself right back selling light bulbs. And it's a dilemma. Because I, I'm sitting in this chair and I know that I can do this work. And I can feel the persuasiveness coming out. And it's like, you know, it's oily and slick and it's sliding in between cracks and it's making stuff happen and whatnot. And, and then I catch myself halfway through it and it's like, I can't do this anymore. I can't do it anymore. Because somebody's going to go home and say to their wife, I don't have a job anymore. Baby, I can't beat you tonight because I'm not working anymore. Why? Because I was oily and slick. Right there. I mean, where do you draw the line? I know I have to feed my family, but do I have to destroy somebody else's? Mm -hmm.